we have tonight are two uh, members of BAM. One is President Sean, and I've known him for a little while. He uh, works at uh, the Vibrarium. Uh, is that the name of uh, In uh, Berkeley. So he's a reptile guy, but he also uh, does a lot of wildlife things and so forth, and he's really into mushrooms. And then Jill. Oh, there, sorry. Um, and uh, she uh, has also been involved with uh, BAM from the beginning, and she uh, went and got a degree in actual microremediation. So it's a very rare topic, a rarefied topic, but she, you can talk to her firsthand about all the wonderful things that you can do. So, without further ado, uh, you want to go first? Okay. So, Jill will go first, and then we'll tell you all about BAM and the wonderful things. Uh, hello, so um, we all got into this group mostly, um, Bay Area Applied Mycology, it used to be Bay Area Radical Mycology, but we changed it to Applied, which I was very glad about, because Radical sounds like it's extreme nowadays. Um, <laughs> So we all got into it mostly, mostly because of the oil spills that were happening and at that time Paul Stamets was looking at, you know, uh, having the hair nets and using the mushrooms to clean up oil and we originally thought that we were going to be like a group on site ready to, uh, to work on that just in case, you know, we were needed and we'd have um, mushrooms like berries and we've actually grown a lot since then. Uh, but that's where where we had come from, is all of us were thinking very much that mushrooms are medicine for the earth. Uh, so, this is my first question. If you guys have read Paul Stamets, my Sunday morning, you know this. Um, okay. um, so, mycofiltration uh, is using fungi to filter organisms, gluten, and silts out of the water. Which we've done a project on. You guys will you guys will see plenty of our pictures in a bit. It's just like a run a rundown, so so we're all on the same page. Uh, microforestry is using fungi to restore and sustain forests. And then I am really am interested in um, in environmental toxins, so microremediation is where I'm most interested in. And And is using fungi to degrade or remove toxins. So, uh, the question is what can you clean up with microremediation? There's actually quite a bit. Uh, you can remove certain bacteria from waterways. Uh, they break down cigarette butts, and those things are hard to, to break down, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, dye effluents, um, there's different types of dyes that have these different chemical structures that some of them, um, mycelium and uh, the enzymes are very useful in breaking down. Uh, heavy metals, they don't break it down because they, um, because they don't change the atomic structure because there's no nuclear chemistry happening, but what they do is they uptake it into the mushrooms and then you can collect the mushrooms that have bioaccumulated it and remove it from the contaminated area. Uh, petroleums, again, the, the more common one that people have heard about and we're hopefully going to be doing more work on that soon, which is a long time in the making, but so we're really excited. Um, then there's radiation, which is super interesting because you guys know radiation is hard to clean up, right? It's um, the radiation has a half-life, and so eventually it'll wear itself down, but that can literally be thousands of years, and we're not talking about human timescales. So they tend to uptake that the same way they do the heavy metals. And mushrooms can actually grow pretty readily in, um, in high-contaminated radiation areas. And then endocrine disrupting chemicals, your endocrine system is your hormone system. So very important for homeostasis, not only for differences in gender, but for basically your whole keeping keeping your body happy at that right temperature and all of that is endocrine disrupting chemicals and they can help remove that too. Uh, so there's different techniques uh, using the fungi. You can use the actual fungal cells and that's good because it's low tech, right? You can you can um, different people can 
use it. Uh, you have the mycelium growing on a substrate and then run the contamination through the substrate. Eventually it should take out, you know, of course you got to do the math to see how much substrate you need versus your concentration. But then you just do the math and you see uh, at what point you've removed the contaminant enough for it to be clean. Uh, then, if you wanted to get more high tech, you can remove the enzymes from the fungi. And you can either have them free, kind of floating in the solution, and these are your lactases and your uh, manganese uh, paradoxase. And then you can have it immobilized, so you can like attach the enzymes onto um, a substrate. And that one's cool, because then if you use it all, then you can reset it. So that's mostly done with your lap cases. <coughs> and here we have a beautiful picture of the mycelium. So it's, again, use of the fungal cells are the direct use of living fungi in the remediation. Um, so uh, I did my thesis on endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, BPA, you guys know the, this water bottle does not contain BPA. I looked at that. Uh, Nonalphenol is actually something that derives from things we use, you know, you know it, nonalphenol itself is not used so much, but different things degrade into it. And then triclosan was finally banned. I was that, I, like, I was doing my research and it was just a couple of years ago, I was like, bad for frogs, bad for fish, bad for everyone. I'm like, this can't be good for humans. And then they finally found evidence that it's harmful to human livers, so it's now not, no longer in our, um, in our antibacterial soap. So, that's good. I was happy about that, but I guess it still can be in some toothpaste, so keep an eye out for that. Um, so, I was really afraid I wasn't gonna have enough uh, information to go off of when I did my thesis, and I actually kinda did a comparison of plants versus fungi, because I was afraid that there wouldn't be enough information. And, but all of these are studies that have just used the fungal cells. Um, I will happily send you this if you'd like it. Um, just to break down, over here we have our endocrine disruptive chemicals, that's the fungi that was used, all of the treatments are fungi, uh, the endocrine disruptive chemical concentration, rate of removal, and rate of uh, estrogenic activity because of this. Um, because just because you remove the endocrine disrupting chemical does not mean that it degrades into something you like. Yeah. So that's, that's what that's for. And then we have our enzymes. Here's one of the substrates that you can attach the, uh, the enzyme to. And uh, it's, it's more work to set up originally, but then it's kind of cool because then you can reuse it again. It's really small. What, uh, what is the substrate? Like, uh, what did you say that it's like, attached to? Huh? Like, what, what is the substrate that it attaches to? Cross-linked enzyme aggregates. I uh, those. Yeah, those, those things. <laughs> so here's uh, studies that have used enzymes. Uh, so again, we have our BPA, nonalphenol, and triclosan. We have our fungi, some of which you might be familiar with, you guys. And then the treatment method, which varies more because, um, so we have free lactase and immobilize. And then again, the, um, the concentration, the rate of removal, and the rate of removal of the estrogenic activity. So, there is a lot of information available. That's the fun thing is, Google Scholar is like my favorite thing ever, because you just, they're like, I want to find a scientific paper on this, and maybe you can't get access to the paper, but you can generally get the, um, the abstract, and so you can see if it's worth it to you to try to hunt down this paper. Uh, of course, we have mycelium learning. Awesome, and then we have um, different books. Uh, then we start to get into the um, scientific articles. Uh, I have this this review one is really really good. If you're like interested in this, it's just kind of like I don't even know where to start. Uh, but I'm but I'm okay with reading something at a, like a higher level. And again, it was like a little bit intimidating at first, but you just really take your time, go through, Google everything. This is like the best thing to read. And then we have more. And like, there's so much information available. Like, if it wasn't even a problem. So, um, yeah, I just want everyone who likes mushrooms to know that there's a lot of interesting studies done not only on their 
what like uh, the classification, but like how they can be used to to make the world better, cleaner. So, yeah. uh, I'm gonna start off with a couple of disclaimers. I'm not a scientist. I'm a high school dropout actually. Self-taught. So. Uh, In addition to that, we whittled down this presentation from 97 <laughs> slides to 60-something slides, and for a few moments there are no slides at all. <laughs> so I'm a little worried about how much time I'm going to have, so I'm going to ask that we kind of hold questions then, if we can, just so I can steam through this and then have time for questions. So yeah, how did we get our start? Uh, ultimately, we were a bunch of mushroom enthusiasts who read a couple of cool books and decided, wow, we might go to do something with some of this, let's see if we can actually apply it in the field and see if we can make it work. So, being a little bit redundant here, yeah, we started in 19, I'm sorry, 2011 uh, as Barry Radical Mycology. Uh, it took a few years for us to finally come up with lab space, which was our original goal, so we could start working on projects. So that happened in 2014, uh, as Ken was saying, at Omni Commons in the Tennis County neighborhood of Oakland. Uh, we renamed our group to Bay Area Applied Mycology when we started seeking non-profit status because at that point in time, we were also working with pretty big corporations like East Bay Mud, and Bay, uh, East Bay Regional Parks, uh, East Bay Municipal Utility District, uh, and other ones that I can't really mention right now. Uh, so, to make it a little bit easier on us, we figured we'd change the name to Applied Mycology so that it'd be more accepting of what we do. Uh, it was March 26, 2015, we finally got our non-profit status. Yes? Thanks to Joe and several others who put a lot of work into it. So, coming on to our first project. First project was pretty simple. Uh, it was an oak savanna respiration project that was going on in East Bay Mud. The next one. So, the objective here is they wanted to restore some overgrazed cow pastures uh, back into oak savanna habitat, which is quite common in the Bay Area. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> East Bay Mud gave us a collection permit to go out and collect mycorrhizal species. Uh, we went out many a times while we had those permits and collected everything that we could. Uh, a majority of it was, of course, chanterelles and baluets. Um, <laughs> so we collected various types of mycorrhizal species. We brought them back home. We scraped the hell out of them. The gills, every single part of the gill surface. We scraped all of the dirt and smudge. We cut off the stem butts. We put it all into a bucket uh, and collected all of them. That bucket then had water and nutrients added to it and was blended up, making a slurry. And the slurry was then used to water oak seedlings that were being established at a nursery on their property. So it was a variety of different types of oaks. I think it was primarily valley oak and coastal live oak. Uh, they had, what, 100 trees? Yeah. They had quite a bit of trees. They only gave us a few to work with, it was about 50. Um, let me back up a little bit. This project also involved some school children. It was a volunteer project for these Bay Mud. So here's where things got a little bit haywire. They went out to the field and they planted these trees in various locations throughout their watershed. But they didn't necessarily mark which trees were the ones that we had inoculated and which ones were not. So that made the project a little difficult for them. Uh, so we didn't necessarily go to all the properties and track all of the trees. But we did do one area. Um, so, <laughs> there's a good example of some of the mycorrhizal species we collected and where they dirty and all that got scraped into the buckets. These are the buckets they were growing the seedlings in, which are what we slurry. Go ahead on to the next one. Um, once they were established and some hype to them, they were put out in the field. So, um, I forgot the sample size of this particular meadow that we were working on. I want to say it was approximately 30 trees. Every tree that was put out there, not knowing whether it was one that we had inoculated or not, we tagged them all. They all got a three-digit number tag. They were all measured. The scientific information was written down, so we would have the data on the next one. And then they were covered with uh, really three forms of protection. They were given these wax sleeves to protect them from the elements. They were given this larger uh, wire uh, sleeve to protect them from rodents, I believe. And then they had two like serious stakes dug into the ground with like hard wire cloth around to keep the cows from getting to them, keep the cows from trampling them. I don't know if that type stayed on that tree, but on <laughs> 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 the next one. Uh, so that was a fun project that we did. Um, unfortunately, it did happen in a drought year, so we lost a lot of the seedlings. 
Um, it, of course, you know, if you make a truffle tree, it takes a decade to know whether you're actually going to get truffles out of it. Same thing with the Chanterelle Valley Oak. It's going to take a little while for us to know whether this actually worked out or not. So we're still keeping tabs on it, but it didn't necessarily go as well as we wanted to at first, just because of the drought and the fact that they got dried up. So from there, we went on to another project in East Daymont. They use their properties for grazing all the time. After reading about microfiltration, we had approached them about maybe trying a small experiment to see if we could work with some of the food that they might have in their product. So for those of you who don't know, microfiltration is basically the use of mycelium as a membrane for filtering out the more microorganisms, pollutants, and silts that might be percolating through the screen system. On to the next one. So this is Duffel Meadow. This is uh, kind of in between the San Pablo and the Briones Reservoir. Uh, specifically, the area where we were doing our filtration project was out in this open area. We have several projects that have been going on here over the years. So this is kind of home base for us in a lot on the next one, 2012 here. So first thing we did is we cobalt fermented a bunch of uh, straw bales. Well, actually, no. First thing we did is we asked East Bay Mud to deliver a whole truckload of freshly ground wood chips. And they did that quite nicely and readily. Wood chips, right off of the bat, you can't inoculate because they have a natural antifungal agent growing in them uh, that you kind of need to let disperse. Uh, so generally speaking, with any of these projects we're working with wood, we've got to give them two or three weeks at least before we can try to inoculate early projects. Uh, so wood piles were delivered, wood piles were left to sit there in age. Meanwhile, we got a couple of big troughs that held 300 gallons of water. We filled them with eight hay bales. We completely soaked the hay bales, creating an anaerobic environment to sterilize the straw or pasteurize the straw to a certain extent in a cheap way without having to use a bunch of gas. We did go out and flip the hay bales to make sure we got them on both sides since you could see a little bit of this photo. Once the hay or straw, sorry, had been uh, cold water fermented, um, we mixed it with the aged wood chips and we added spawn. The spawn that we used in this particular project, Mr. Ferry Rogosa Anulato, which is the garden giant, commonly used in cultivation, but not necessarily not, uh, native around here, of course. Uh, introduced, yes, native, no. Uh, so, uh, piles were mixed. They were left with tarps over them and cardboard on top and let sit for about three weeks. After two to three weeks, we went back to check on things, and as you can see here with the Elmira, we got a nice, healthy mat of mycelium growing in among the straw and wood chips that on the next slide. So once everything was, made, everything was grown in, uh, we sacked up all of the mixture in the burlap sacks, which were donated to us by Pete's Coffee. We sewed those sacks closed, and we hauled them out to the field where we wanted to place them. Next slide. Uh, group photo. We had to take a group photo before we placed them all. Next slide. So this is two different angles of the same basic uh, project, uh, looking downhill and looking uphill. There was a fence running between the creek area where we decided to do this, so it was kind of done in two patches. Um, we laid out this matrix of bags with approximately 70 burlap sacks that are out there. And then since the cows were out there too, uh, we kind of hammered them all down. You can see we got stakes, both uh, steel stakes that are basically wrought iron shaped like you would pound it in the ground, and then wooden stakes, uh, standard uh, foundation uh, forming stakes. Uh, so that was just kind of to secure everything into place. Um, still a drought year. It held up for quite a while. A lot of water passed through it. Logistically, it seemed to be working out until you really add the cows to the situation. Oh, sorry. That, that again. We went back a few weeks after laying them all out. This is the mycelial growth we had between our last sacks. It was clearly doing the job just fine as far as spreading and becoming a cohesive matrix of material. Okay. Came back a couple of weeks after that, and here we have fruiting bodies. Yeah. And I mean everywhere. We had <laughs> we had area growing out of all these bags and tons of them. So it looks great, worked, did the job, on to the next photo. Proud papas, there we go, <laughs> got seen on the heat, you know it's under a whole big old load of them. Uh, and then here is where things Transpired. Uh, the victim, or I'm sorry, the culprit right there, yeah. a whole pack of them. Uh, clearly, over time, uh, we, the, the water dried up, the mycelium no longer really held in there too well, and the cows trampled the crap out of that. So, uh, you know, it was a learning project. I'm glad we did it. Uh, we cleaned up our mess, we pulled out all our steaks, we ripped up all our burlap bags, and uh, went from there. So, the following year, they gave us another project. Uh, 
this one was going to be a little bit different in the sense that it was a holding corral. So the way that East Bay Mud works, the way a lot of these other places work that graze cattle, um, especially in the reservoir area, is they'll bring in the cattle in the spring and the summer months while there isn't much rain, allow them to graze freely, do what they want, running free, but before things start storming again, they bring all the cattle back to a holding pin and they truck them all back out of there. Uh, they don't want their waste there while it's raining too heavy. So this is kind of like the main holding pin that a lot of the cattle come in and go out of, so it's definitely full of a lot of the fluid. <laughs> um, and yes, plenty of food. So we did actually two different uh, bunkers, as we call them, of, of these bags. One of them was oyster mushrooms, trying something different and something that you can find natively. And on the other side of the corral, where there was a little lying area, we did stroke area again. Uh, the main difference with this one is at least the oyster bags that are seen here on the other side of the fence from where the cows can actually get to them, so they did end up holding up a lot longer. Um, but we were still in a drought here, so we didn't get a lot of data out of that project, unfortunately. Logistically, great. Learning curve once again, not a lot of that. Uh, they did all end up fruiting. Sorry, continue on the next one. Um, I jumped ahead of myself here. Here we are with the mycelium again, growing on this crop before we bagged it. So there's Joe, some of you may know him. Hey, this is Stephanie, this is Look at that. I'm on the next one again, bagging it up, sewing it up, and then on to the next one, laying it out. Your photo. So now we're caught up. On to the next one. So, of course, whenever we do one of these projects, I tried to take home a bag or two to make sure that things are working right. So, these were a couple of bags that I took home with oyster mushrooms in that project, and they were delicious. They were fine. <laughs> okay, so, uh, another aspect of what we do is microforestry. Um, we had started a really good rapport with East Bay Mud at this point. Um, they liked our style, they liked our gumption, and they liked the volunteer sort of... Uh, uh, gusto that we had. Um, so, uh, they were starting to cut down a bunch of trees and they mentioned to us, you know, hey, what are your thoughts about decomposition and, you know, maybe trying to play with that a little bit. So, we, of course, embraced the idea. So, for those of you that don't know, again, microforestry, the ecological forest management system implemented to enhance forest ecosystems and plant communities through the introduction of mycorrhizal and saprotrophic fungi. Our next so, why fungi? Well, in theory, it, well, not in theory, what we like to think. Uh, it accelerates the decomposition cycle by introducing the mycelium to what you're trying to break down. Uh, recycle and recovery of woodland debris. Uh, if it is the right type of fungi then it, and it gets into the soil, it can help reduce erosion by helping keep the soils intact. Uh, it increases the nutrient flow and moisture retention in those environments. And it provides a cool niche for flora and fauna. Photos below. The little slender salamander over there on the left hand side. I believe that's a bull of mantle slug on the right hand side. And the trillion there in the middle. Not that that had anything to do with mushrooms. Okay, so <coughs> previously, what East Bay Mud used to do, um, well, backstory a little bit. When they built all the reservoirs, they of course then decided to plant all the reservoirs. The main tree they used when doing this was the Monterey pine tree. So this was all done about 70 to 90 years ago, which is roughly the lifespan of those trees. And they're starting to get a lot of die out, not only from old age, but from rot, from disease, and from parasites. Previously, they would use a, a horse logging crew to haul out all the logs. This is because obviously in the backwoods of the reservoirs, the big logging trucks aren't going to hold up to mud. So they would hire a horse crew to come up, log the, log the trees, haul them out to a roadside where a truck could easily pick them up, and then they would take that number to the lumber mill. You know, a couple decades ago, that would actually generate enough money to pay for the job, but then gas prices went up and things got a little crazy and lumber, that particular lumber wasn't making as much money as it did. Second to that, East Bay Mud wanting to be better stewards of land kind of was feeling like a little bit of a guilty conscience here. You know, we have all this material and all, this, all these nutrients that could really be going back into the environment and we're just hauling it all away. So they decided to take a different approach to try to leave things on site, but the problem that that introduced was a possible fire hazard. Now they had all these dry stacks of kindling laying around the place. So that was when they approached us. So uh, one of the projects that we decided to work on, this is one of the bigger projects, we tackled the turkey tail. Um, you know, we were trying to think of what's going to grow on pine, and this is one of the first things that is in the 
cultivation trade that is extremely aggressive. It's known to grow on virtually all dead conifers and hardwoods that are out there. Uh, probably one of the most commonly found mushrooms out there. Found on every continent in the world except for Antarctica and, and the Arctic, which is a continent. Uh, and you know, primary decomposers breaking down complex organ, or organic compounds and recycling important biological elements. And of course, the saprophytic, non-parasitic woodland. So we were using turkey tails in this project um, on the next slide. And we were doing this through mycelium sawdust pond. As Ken was mentioning, far west fungi, awesome people, love them. They've been helping us out a lot over the years. Uh, they provide us the majority of our materials for a lot of our projects, to be honest. They grow out where we need what we need them to do if they can, or allow us to raise their compost piles, just give us spent blocks if, if that's what we're going to be using. They were one of the first certified organic mushroom farms on the West Coast. Kudos for them. Good for the environment when we're putting this stuff out there. Um, these, the, the, the sawdust lawn is grown in five pound bags. It's grown on old oak sawdust that is a recycled byproduct from local cabinet manufacturers out there. Or at least that was the love story I last heard. So these are the five pound bags in the box in the middle frame. To the left hand side, we got casing kale breaking up the blocks into smaller chunks. And on the right hand side, we have a party of people with a bunch of buckets running around and putting it in the hole. Next slide will show you how we do the inoculation. So the inoculation methods have kind of changed over time into a multitude of different ways, but the most common ones that we tend to use is either a wedge cut or a double cut to change this off. So the tree's been felled, the tree is dead, it's been laying there for two to three weeks so that all the antifungal uh, properties are out of it, and then they come through with a chainsaw and either cut out these fancy little pie wedges, or they will just double trough leaving a big slit halfway down the tree that we can then come through and pack full of material. So on the left we have the slot, on the right we have the pie, same um, So that's the basics on that. Next one. After we've inoculated the trees, we give the uh, inoculation points for that cover to protect them from any animals or passengers by that might be curious. Uh, we identify every tree that we are working on with a three-digit number tag once again. Um, this is a great example of my Sylvania tree trunk right there going on. Uh, so the data we collected on these projects, each and every one, these detailed photographs, of course, <coughs> measurements, <coughs> length and diameter of the logs is good. GPS coordinates of where these logs are, the number of inoculations points that were in each tree, and what style of inoculation point it was, whether it's a wedge cut, a double cut, or the hybrid of the two. Um, also, what species of fungi were used? Uh, we used, in some projects, multiple types. We always had controls. Uh, so I'd say about a third of what we did on most of our projects were usually controls, <laughs> control stacks that didn't have anything done with them just to see what would happen on their own. Uh, so there was a combination on these trees that we would have to uh, notate as to whether it was a freshly felled tree or some of them were actually older trees that had fallen earlier, but they still ended up ledge cutting and wanting us to decompose them. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to keep track of that as well. And then other potential, uh, potential pertinent information in regards to the individual project of the next one. So this is kind of taking a step back. Most of those photos were from a more recent project. This was the very first pine tree that we worked on. It was done slightly differently. And it was this project right here that really opened things up in our relationship with East Bay Mud and with East Bay Regional Park. So taking a little bit of a step back, this is in 2012. Um, I mean, asked for advice on dealing with monitoring pines, which I just told you about. Uh, I'm kind of keeping myself on all this here. So, uh, removal from the landscapes, the nutrients from the storage of logs. Uh, the important thing is that on this particular project, we did not use turkey tail, we used Pleurotis pulmonaris. Uh, this is one of the ones that was recommended to us because it's one of the few that might actually grow on pine. Uh, same basic methods where we did the double cut, the wedge cut, or there was another one that I don't have photos of, uh, with the sawdust. Or alternatively, we drilled holes and used wooden dowel plug method. So, November 2013, a year later, we went back to check on the tree and it was happily fruiting, which made us quite stuff. So, uh, here are some photos we got of Joe and you know, uh, making some uh, pie uh, and mycelium growing in between the, 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 the main part of the log and wedge that's holding it in place. On the next slide. Some of the calamals we found over there, I'm a reptile guy, I like talking about reptiles, right? We got the gopher snakes, garter snakes, millipedes, I forget what that flower is. 
You saw the ear problem on the next one. Okay, so this looks pretty cool. We got oyster mushrooms growing out of a tree. Uh, I, I wish it was as beautiful for me as it may be for you, but I know the sad facts that this is only a few months later. And a majority of these mushrooms that are growing, as you can tell, are growing from the sawdust spawn that's packed into these holes and not necessarily out of the tree itself. But it shows you that the conditions are right, the mushrooms were happily fruiting, sporing on the wood, all around a good story for us. The next photo is not very pretty, but is what I'm very excited about. Oh my those are some old-ass dry oyster mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. The difference between those old-ass dry oyster mushrooms and the ones you saw earlier is these are growing from the bottom of the log. Wow. The mycelium had run all the way through the tree, and these were fruiting from underneath, wow. away from where the inoculation points. All the inoculation points were on the top surface of the tree, just because it was the easiest way to go about doing that. So this was to us success. You know, it was oyster mushrooms. Sure, maybe they got there on their own, and it wasn't from the work that we did, but it seemed highly plausible that since a year earlier we were out there hammering on them, and then that it was probably due to us. So, uh, that was an ecstatic moment for us, and it was an ecstatic moment for each day. On to the next one. So from there, we jumped from one tree to over 40 trees. This is Old Man Ridge. This project went on for a couple of years. We used several different species. Um, turkey tail, jumbo gym, which there's been some... I, I'm not sure that's the proper common name for it or not. Big Laughing Jim is another one people tend to call it, but Jim not the Jimnopolis, <coughs> Junonensis, or I forgot the other one. Uh, and then always the mushrooms as well. Uh, also, every time you guys did a fungus fair, at the end of the fair, when we were getting ready to throw all this stuff into the compost pile, we ran around and collected every single saprophytic species that we could find. We took them home, we put them in a bucket with some water, we blended it up, we went back out to that site, and we slurried things that hadn't been treated before. So some of those control stacks that hadn't been treated got that treatment. Some of the wood chip piles that were left behind were slurry, so that maybe we can grow more material for the next project and collect that for that. Um, and we did that with oyster mushrooms as well. Uh, we also set up a couple trail cameras, because that's another one of my hobbies. I like trail cameras. Uh, just to see what wildlife's around there, see what's poking curiosity. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with that as well. Next slide. So here's our big group of people. Well, it's only about quarter of us. This is pretty typical to one of our stacks of logs. It's not, you know, that may be two trees worth of trunks, or it may all be from one tree, but it's pretty clean. They've taken the branches off, they've taken the boughs off, they've cut the notches for us, it's good to go. In this particular case, we didn't number each individual tree because all four of them were lumped there together. We just numbered that raft of logs and then same with the next raft of logs. Uh, so here we are having an inoculation party uh, on the next slide. This is our map, it's a pretty big area. Every single one of these flags, every single one of these descriptions is another raft, raft of anywhere from four to eight logs sitting uphill up against the tree. Um, <laughs> so most of them are labeled as to whether they've been treated or not. You can see there's a few controls there. You can see we have a chip pile label over here. You can see I have a little trail camera one too. Um, but it's a pretty good sized area that we're working on with this particular project. So I'm pretty stoked on it. On the next slide. Uh, again, we got oyster mushrooms growing out from the mycelated sawdust pond, but still growing out of the tree and happy nonetheless. On the next slide. And the next year we had Jumbo Jim growing out from the stumps. We did inoculate a few stumps over there too. And that's the stump over there. Uh, so that was considered a success as well. Continue on. And cute little wildlife. We've got gray foxes and baby deers and velvet bucks and coyotes and turkeys and all kinds of other stuff that came through while we were there. So pretty exciting stuff. There's an example of a trail camera up there to the left. If you're familiar with one. And this next slide is just because it's corny. Yeah.
East Bay Regional Parks for getting ready to go buck wild chopping down a bunch of eucalyptus trees all through Berkeley and all around the area. And people were kind of freaking out about it. When they cut down eucalyptus trees, they have a tendency to grow back suckers uh, quite rapidly. Um, so their approach is they cut the tree down and then they go around and they spray all the stumps and scar them, which is a herbicide, hoping to kill out the trees so they don't have to go back and keep cutting the, the suckers that come up. So we had asked them, they were getting ready to do like 100 or something trees like that. We just asked them if they would mind setting a few aside from us and not spraying them with poison and seeing if we could try doing it with our approach and what would happen. So uh, we approached them about recently cut stuff, uh, gave us 30 stumps uh, initially, and then we had already had another 30 that we had been working on with East Bay Mud over by the Shakespeare Theater in Orinda. Um, the primarily, primary method for this particular approach, uh, we didn't do the pie cuts, we just kind of cross-hatched the tops of the stumps and then tried to smear our back material into those. Uh, in this particular project, we also went with different species. We were kind of going for a double-edged approach um, in the sense that, you know, there's the brown rot and the white rot mushrooms. We decided we would try to use one of each to really break things down. Uh, so we went with sul sulfur shelf uh, and turkey tail again. Uh, or a combination, we did one, the either, or a combination of both on all of these, on uh, the majority of these stuff, uh, leaving a few controls, of course, every time. Uh, our commitment to them is that we would go back every six months and remove any suckers if they were to be growing, so they wouldn't have to worry about it, and of course, to keep them uh, abreast of the situation. So we went out every six months, we would cut off the suckers, we would actually weigh the removed material to get an idea over time if we actually are having any kind of effect or whether it's reversed. Um, overall, checking the mycelial health of where we had inoculated the trees, if we're seeing any kind of action at all. Um, and, you know, it seemed to be taking hold. So we were pretty happy with the results here. Uh, on to the next slide. So here's a nice cross hatched stump up here in the left hand side. The wedge cuts are a fell log next to that, so it's a little separate here. So we've got a bunch of the fell logs over here, too. And us just trucking all this stuff up to the project site. Um, uh, that was, this one is Redwood Regional Park. He's very cool. Uh, on the next slide. We got uh, Alan Rockefeller over here doing some uh, sawdust pond. We got me over here putting in some uh, uh, dowel uh, plugs. Uh, these dowel plugs we actually made ourselves. The, that was the sulfur shelf. Uh, thanks to Max, when that was done in our labs, that was pretty cool. We didn't actually have to buy a product from somebody to that particular aspect of it. On to the next slide. And here we are, that's about a year later, a year and a half later, I think. We got turkey tails coming out of stumps. We've got sulfur shelf coming off of that one. Uh, so, again, things seem to be going forward. And a pretty good clip there. On to the next slide. And another slender salamander we lifted for that sack. <laughs> so clearly the conditions were pretty nice for him. The, well, we did not inoculate that stump. This was another stump that was there, and I forget the name of that mushroom, but it was going sure. right. That's the one. Uh, mm -hmm. So now we're trying to clone that, because we see it everywhere, and especially on the eucalyptus, and we want to get it in our library so we can use it for future projects. But it's really thin, and it's really hard to clone. Uh, and, yeah, on the next one. Okay, so this is kind of a new realm for us, and we haven't dabbled with it too much. Microremediation. Um, you know, when we started the group, as she said, it was all about trying to heal the planet and get rid of oil and all this other kind of stuff. But we realized really quickly that we don't have money to do proper testing. We didn't really have people on the crew that had hazardous material training, uh, nor was the big refineries really willing to listen to us. Uh, so, the very first project we ever took, uh, we kind of did, you know, renegade style. We went to a local auto shop and asked them for some crankcase oil. So they saved us some crankcase oil. We mixed up small batches by hand in Mino's backyard. Uh, I don't forget, six, ten totes? How many totes? No, were six. six totes? Okay, so there's all six. Six totes of material uh, that had been mixed uh, to varying uh, degrees of uh, Pollutants, I suppose you would say. So, you know, 5%, 10% by weight or by volume. Uh, and then, of course, inoculated with the spawn, let them sit in these totes. And immediately we were seeing growth. Immediately we were getting mushrooms. Nobody was going to eat those mushrooms. But uh, it did not seem to be having a negative effect. Uh, quantitatively, you 
you know, did we get much data out of it? No, because we couldn't afford to pay the people to do the test to do what we wanted to do. We also had learned from the people that we found out about the testing that they would recommend that we didn't use the used crankcase motor oil because it had a lot of metal and other things in there that might throw off results and that we should really be working with, you know, un unused, fresh crude oil if we could get our hands on it. Okay. Uh, So this was a project that we did not do, but some members of our group participated in. This is the Napa-Sonoma Fire Action Coalition. After the fires up there, they were super concerned about runoff into the streams and about all the pollutants that might be getting into the streams. So they were working on a project where they were putting waddles out to help protect that. So a recent Northern California fire sovereigns to make uh, make reduce the effect of erosion, mitigate, remediate any possible runoff from the burn areas before they create the storm drains, peaks, and watershed. Using both standard straw waddles, just for filtration, and modified myceliated straw waddles placed in key locations of uh, full work to help slow down the runoff, filter out any debris, and capture and break down any toxins. On the next slide. So, in this particular photo, if I'm not mistaken, and I think you know correctly if I am, he was one of the ones involved in this. These are the lower three or four straw waddles are just standard straw waddles, and the green one on top is a myceliated one, which was mixed with uh, straw, compost, a little bit of manure, and oyster mushroom. Uh, and then they were placed out strategically in hopefully moist areas to help absorb and break down those things. Um, they ran into a little bit of the same dilemma that we did, which was there wasn't a lot of rain right after the fires. So we don't know how well this material held up over the month or two of, of dryness. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. But this is one of their uh, layouts, and on the next slide. Another one of their layouts. And then lastly, when we did finally start getting some rain, it was very pleasant to see. And this wasn't on the waddles, this was just in the general around area. Very pleasant to see life coming back very quickly. You know, trees re sprouting, crowns sprouting from the bases as far as chaparral and stuff goes. Um, you know, grasses and mosses coming back, of course. And then a whole bunch, I don't know which fungi this is either, but it was everywhere. Uh, so it seems to be. Doing a pretty good job of healing itself. So, a pleasant surprise to see the large fruiting and fungi throughout the burn area after the rains. And that's pretty cool. uh, okay, and now we're on to BAM Labs and Counterculture. So, here is a slide of one of our little workshops. I believe what they're working on here is a homemade flow hood for being able to do like the uh, agar transfers. We get a pretty good amount of people showing up. I am personally not necessarily much on that aspect of the, uh, the group. Uh, we have Seth here and Jill, who really are on that, and Mario. Um, but it's exciting for us to have this space, that's for sure. On the next slide. Um, one of the experiments that we're working on again, oil. We got here a uh, petri dish that has uh, three spots that are always spawned and have been introduced on an agar in the center, a uh, hollow area cut out with oil has been introduced. Within no time at all, you can see the mycelium from those three uh, uh, inoculations spreading all throughout the, the petri dish. Uh, the oil pretty much disappeared and sucked up into the agar, uh, and several weeks later, the entire dish completely grown over with oyster mushroom and mycelium once again. Uh, on the left-hand side, it looks like they're trying to maybe clone King Trumpet, King Trumpet oysters. Uh, it's been split open, and they're knifing out a center section. Probably be put on the agar to put it in the library for future use. Yeah, for the record, I this uh, amount of oil, I was thinking way less, and actually Seth was the one to say, let's go full out and see, just see if it works, and it totally works. So, always aim big, so you never know when you'll get there. <laughs> This is a cool slide because it's just a little sample of some of the libraries that we've collected over the last couple of years now. So various strains on various colors of agar, uh, and as best we can, we keep up on it and propagate, spread, and keep them going. <coughs> so the idea being that you know down the road, if we need to, we can ramp up any of these things to use on future projects, or if other people need them for certain things, we'll be able to have access to them. Next slide. So, uh, the future, area by my the future, here we go. Uh, the crude oil experiment, we just recently, you know, I told you about the paint case experiment the first time. Well, after 
doing all this work with these many regional parks and these many municipal utility districts and twisting here for a little while with the refineries, we finally had one that was willing to send us some oil. So we did actually recently get a five gallon bucket uh, of untouched, untapped crude oil, like it would be busting out of the size of a oil vessel trying to deliver it to someplace. Uh, so that's <laughs> specifically what we would want to be able to break down in an emergency situation if it were to come. Uh, another project we're working on right now, although it's, yeah, I think it's going to happen, uh, one of our members had a property that had been contaminated and wanted to come out and help work with trying to rehabilitate that area. Uh, I forget specifically what it was contaminated with, but it's another stroke area project that we're going to work on here soon. We had our first speaker series. We had Captain Harris to come out and do a talk for us about. Uh, uh, it was cool. Uh, we had never had a speaker before. We're not quite as awesome as that. I said that yet, that's for sure. But we're getting there. So we're working on trying to make that a more common thing. Right now, we're looking at two a year. Maybe next year we'll have four a year. Maybe eventually we'll be able to get one every month or something. Uh, we've talked about doing a YouTube channel so we can put up videos when we're doing our micro remediation projects, when we're doing our workshops, when we're doing our uh, our classes, uh, just to get it out there. Uh, there's been discussion of having interviews, podcasts with people that you might want to hear talk, you know, with a trad pod or whatever the case may be, and get those out there. Uh, we certainly like to continue with lectures and presentations. We are offering workshops and will continue to work, offer workshops on cultivation, identification, dyeing with mushrooms and other plants, medicines that you can make, tinctures that you can make, microscopy, DNA, cloning, and you know, even as simple as photographing. And then, of course, as always, working project, social media, keeping up with Facebook, Instagram. And I started a Nine Naturalist account for Dan. So if you're out there hiking around and you see something cool and you want to download a mushroom and tag it into our group, then there's more cloud there, too, as well. Um, we're getting the tail end. Other projects. Uh, we keep doing fungus fairs, of course, trying to raise money to pay. Now that we're starting to get a little bit of money in the kitty, we can actually start paying for some of these projects in regards to getting testing done for them uh, when they are being offered. We, of course, want to continue teaching classes. We'll continue working with that. We already talked about the speaker series. Uh, and then, of course, more dining projects as well. On to the next slide. Is that it? All right. And then again, more to learn more. Um, groups like ours, groups like yours. Uh, you know, of course, mycelium running was the one that kind of started it all for most of us. Um, organic mushroom farming and micro-remediation by Trad Potter is definitely a favorite. Uh, Radical Mycology by Peter McCoy is one thick tome of a book, but it's got some very useful information. And on a more simple level, slightly smaller, uh, Earth Repair by uh, Lula Darwish, uh, which is also a great book. And I know I'm missing several others, but that's some of the uh, ones that we commonly go to in regards to these projects. And that's it. Oh, no, acknowledgments. I'd like to take a second to thank all the awesome people from East Day Mud, Scott Hill, Virginia Northrop, Jonathan Price, from the Far West Fungi, the Grown family, they have been amazing, and Justin Pierce, who's part of the propagation crew, uh, Trent Pierce, and the staff of the East Bay Regional Parks, been amazing, and then of course MSSF has been extremely supportive, supportive of this as well. Um, so, at that time, if anybody has some questions about <laughs> Oh, if you want to buy a shirt, I'll <laughs> <laughs> pay for a project. You have a question back there? Yeah, I wanted to um, find out um, whether or not you had any like particular results from eucalyptus and the amount of debris that you had to cut off versus the ones that were in the control group. So that project's only a couple years old. Um, we don't, you know, we, we just need a bigger sample size, uh, more time, I think, to be able to figure that one out. Uh, so I don't have an answer for you at this point. I don't have any concrete data to be like, yes, this is working, no, this is not. Unfortunately, the majority of our projects are still kind of in the infant stages. And to be honest, in the beginning stages of most of these projects, it really wasn't so much about like, it was really just about is it feasible, can we do it, the logistics behind it, because, you know, 
we can sit here all day long working in East Bay Mud doing this, but if it's not something that's cost effective for them to be able to add to their tool chest as a possibility, then it's not something that's really going to go very far. So we got to try to keep it pretty simple, pretty sweet. Um, the data collection is certainly a bigger focus of what we're doing now that we're starting to get a lot more clout and now that we're starting to get more money once again. Uh, so hopefully soon we'll have some kind of report that we can get back on that. But, but you cut off the suckers, right? We are cutting, cutting off the suckers. The point is, is to stop those trees from reproducing. It is true. And if we have to cut off the suckers for a year or three, Three while the mushrooms do the job on the stump and eventually killing it out instead of them putting 10 gallons of garland on it and letting it sit there in the environment for God knows how long, um, we're willing to take that gamble. And if it ends up panning out, that it can work out. You know, once again, another tool in the chest, another option for them to try to use. But at this point, is it necessarily time or cost effective? Eh, not really, not necessarily. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Any other questions? The uh, oyster mushroom on the far side from where you inoculated it, yes. how long was it after you inoculated it that you saw uh, that, was a, that was a little over a year. I want to say it was about a year and three months. Roughly. Pretty rapid in my opinion. Yeah. Have you thought about using something that's more parasitic instead of just eating dead wood? Well, the problem with that, I mean, yeah, we could bring in like, you know, Honey mushroom, but I don't think these big mud wants honey mushroom all over their properties, right? You know, it's going to kill all the other trees too. So we I try to stick to things that aren't. Deadwoods, yeah. I mean, it's not going to kill the cambium. It's, uh, it's hard enough just to kill a tree with uh, herbicide. Yeah, 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 yeah. True, yeah. true. But I would, yeah, I, I certainly be interested in hearing more about it if you have suggestions in that regard. We're always open to hearing, you know, as they say, I don't have much of a scientific background, so I'm always open to talking to other people about their opinions. Anybody else have any questions? Well, you know where to find us. We're right here. <laughs> <laughs> we have five minutes.